Hi, it's Dennis Daly. With the death at age 93 of journalist Daniel Shore, a real link to the past has been severed. Not only was he one of the last remaining people who had worked with Edward R. Murrow, Shore was intimately involved in Watergate as an investigative reporter. As a matter of fact, he was on Nixon's hit list. And because of his knowledge of Watergate, he was asked to narrate a Discovery Network Channel program on the history of Watergate, nearly six full hours. When that was released, I sat down at his home and talked to him, and he said much of Watergate in the 70s actually began because of an incident back in the 60s, and the fear in the Nixon campaign that the head of the Democratic Party, Lawrence O'Brien, knew a little too much about what had been going on behind the scenes. In 1969, there had been an illegal campaign contribution made by Howard Hughes through one of his agents to B.B. Rebozo, who was President Nixon's great friend down in Florida, and deposited by B.B. Rebozo in cash in a safe deposit box as a kind of a nest egg for his friend, President Nixon. That became a part of the Senate Watergate investigation, in fact. But Nixon worried whether O'Brien knew about that, thought he did know about it, and that knowing about it would explode that fact at some crucial moment during the campaign. And so obsessively, they had to go in and find out whether O'Brien had that. But Nixon, being Nixon, couldn't level with the people about what it was he wanted. And so in a series of things which you'll find on tape and which you'll find in the in the Haldeman diary, he kept saying, we got to go after O'Brien. Uh, we got to get after O'Brien. Have you moved on O'Brien yet? Even though later in those interviews with David Frost, Nixon would say that covering up what he had done was absolutely stupid. At the time, the cover-up was on the minds of everyone working closely with Nixon. The White House was so involved in covert activities, it even started coming up with code names for its various projects. When they decided to come up with this uh, project called Gemstone, the project political intelligence, including breaking into the Watergate, Jeb Magruder uh, was told the prime target of this is Larry O'Brien. And when they put a bug on the phone in the wrong place, they didn't get anything, they had to break in a second time, and Magruder says to Liddy, we want what O'Brien's got in his desk. We want to know what he's got. And Liddy then reached the conclusion, which he wrote about, wrote about in his own book, that I had thought we were trying to get something on O'Brien. And I began to realize, no, they wanted me to find what O'Brien might have about them. And all the investigation into Watergate was playing out on national radio and TV every day. I asked Daniel Shore, who had lived for some time in Europe, what other parts of the world thought when we Americans were trotting out our dirty laundry. In most parts of the world, they didn't understand it. Uh, they surely didn't uh, understand it. For example, in China, Nixon would go to China, and in his conversations with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, they would they would sort of say, "What is that all about?" And it was very easy to to assume that uh, that what you really had here was Democrats and Republicans, and the Democrats were finding some way of trying to pull the rug from under the Republicans. And it was all part of the way politics was played in America. The Russians had least of all any problem about understanding it because it was there were conspiracies in the government, conspiracies of the people outside the government to disrupt what was going on in the government. They could understand that. That was the Bolshevik Revolution all over again. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, the, that uh, um, uh, Watergate was a vast mystery because you couldn't understand Watergate without understanding a lot about America. I mean, in Britain, you couldn't understand America. If you had a Watergate scandal in Britain, then you would immediately get the resignation of the Prime Minister in a new election. They don't fundamentally understand over there that we elect our presidents for four years, and they're there unless we find a way of kicking them out of office, and that no matter what Congress thinks of them, they're still there. And no matter what he thinks of Congress, they're still there. That he's not responsible to Congress in any way, although on, on, on August 8, 1974, when he resigned, he sounded as though there was some gridlock in Congress that was the reason for his resignation, but that was something else. So what if Richard Nixon had not seen the handwriting on the wall and had not resigned and was willing to fight his ouster on Capitol Hill? How long might that have dragged out? 
or would have been months. I mean, you know all the ways in which any trial uh, tends to stretch itself out with the various ways you can stretch out a trial. But a political trial before the Senate could have gone on for months, years. Yes, losing Daniel Shore is a big loss because he was not only a great journalist, he had a way of looking into the camera or talking into the microphone with that gentle voice and making us all feel that he really wanted to talk to us. And he left us better educated and more understanding about the world around us. Spending that afternoon with Daniel Shore in Washington was a wonderful experience. I'm Dennis Daly.